back with another episode with my brother Charles Woods here. Uh, this is going to be a dope episode. I am super excited about this because real quick, because we, we're just going to jump right on in. Uh, one of the things about my roles uh, here in Birmingham, and I don't know if I've said this explicitly on this podcast, but I'm also the chairman of the board of directors at the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute. Uh, the coolest thing about that position is that I have the opportunity to meet the heroes and sheroes of the city of Birmingham, but also folks that come really all across the globe, yeah. right? All across yeah. the globe. Um, one of the ways Charles and I got connected, because as the chairman of the board, if you are a board member of any nonprofit, you better be out there raising some money, yes. right? So, <laughs> um, so in the process of us essentially exposing the elements of the institute, we got to take folks through a tour. Yeah. So uh, one of the OGs, shout out John Hope Bryant. I remember when John <laughs> Hope Bryant came in town, came to Birmingham, and um, it was actually a Fortune 500 company. I don't remember the company that, uh, representative that was with them. Um, but we hit up Charles to take us through the institute. Mm -hmm. Now, at the time, of course, I'm a board member, but I've never walked through the institute with someone that could guide me through what I was looking at, right? Because you could see different videos, you can um, listen to different audios, you'll be able to read descriptions of, um, we'll just say, objects that represent what was hit here in the 50s and 60s. Um, but to have someone to give you some context is dope. So we walked through the institute with Charles. And I find it ironic that we are recording this after King Day. Right. right. So King Day, Martin Luther King Jr., of course, shout out to the 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 hero himself. Uh, but the more I learned about Dr. King's legacy, the more I became aware of the Birmingham heroes that really set it off. Yes. That really set it off. So if you fly to Birmingham uh, now or if you've done it prior to nine times out of 10, you flew into the Shuttlesworth airport that's correct so one of the folks that we're going to be talking about today is og triple og triple og fred <laughs> shuttlesworth but before we get into him i definitely want to and i want y'all to hear from this brother charles because he's dynamic he's dope he's dope so i could read a bio but i ain't gonna do that <laughs> i'm gonna let you introduce yourself so for the audience tell folks what you know what they need to know about you um charles was the third i'm originally from san Bernardino, california uh, left that great state in <laughs> 1997. Okay. Um, and I went into, to New Orleans to go to school. I went to Xavier University of Louisiana. Okay. And uh, was there for several years. Took me about five years to graduate. Okay, uh, yeah, there I, you I go. I ain't scared to say that. <laughs> That's within the average, you know, <laughs> at least when I was in school. Um and um, that's where I met the woman that is now my wife, and she's from Birmingham. And so yeah. um, I took an executive decision to move to Birmingham. Absolutely. This was almost like about 19 years ago now, I believe. Yeah. Shout out wifey. Yes, yes, most <laughs> definitely. Um, and the first place I looked for a job was the Institute, you know, but nobody was hiring then. You know? right. and so I got into manufacturing and did some other things. And um, and this kind of, this job kind of rolled around, and, you know, about almost about seven years ago. It'll be seven years in April. Right. Um. Wow. This opportunity opened up, and yeah. you know, I jumped on it. I was I was in the school system at that time, yeah. And I saw this as my dream job. You yeah. know, uh, shout out to Dream Job Podcast. Uh, they yeah. did a podcast on me about the dream job. Yeah. And um, I've been doing it ever since. And so you know, I'm a, just a Black History buff. Yeah. You know, I really love my history. It's something that my mom really instilled in me when I was younger. Mm. Um, she passed on in 2017, but I realized after her death the things that she instilled in me about knowledge yourself and just knowing who you are. And right. so that's something that I carry on now. I'm the uh I'm the owner of Cool Global Educational Consultant. Yeah. You know, as well as marching on tours, um, tour company. And so yeah. I do city tours of the city of Birmingham, you know, pretty regularly. Right. Uh telling this history that we're gonna get into today. Yeah, and absolutely. so absolutely you know, I just love our history and I love teaching it and you know and, and imparting that on to others. Right. And so uh, hopefully some you know People will learn something that they haven't learned, you know, or known today. So. Uh, they will. Every conversation I have with Charles, I'm like, <laughs> bro, I did not know that. And then, and and you know, in transparency, as you know, I've shared on this platform, growing up playing sports, sports was like my thing, and history never really, you know, there there really wasn't an appetite to want to know what happened before. Yeah. Um, now, from a from a family standpoint, so I'm Jamaican by blood, uh, Floridian by birth, so I never forget when my uncle came to Florida. 
uh, to visit us. And he asked me, like, do you know who Marcus Garvey is? And I was like, I don't know who Buddy is. And the way he looked at me, <laughs> you're Jamia Khan. You know, yes, just like, that's like a like, national like, hero. Right, exactly. Right. right. And so he made me do like this, you know, couple of page report. You know, I think I'm like in middle school at the time. Right. right? And right. I had to do this research on Marcus Garvey. And I appreciate that. But it stopped there. So even as I'm here in the States, you know, my awareness of Martin Luther King Jr., um, some of these heroes and sheroes, it really came after college. Wow. Now, Martin Luther King, you're going to know yeah, about yeah, that. Yeah, you know, that, yeah, you're going to know, you know about it. You know, I got a dream. That's they push. Yeah, right, that's right. right. That's right. That's the, you know, that's that's the face and the name that you're going to know right. in a story that is probably most comfortable for them to tell. Yes. <laughs> yes, especially. Yes. Um, uh, but in that same space, there was never a rhythm or an appetite that I was able to create when it pertained to wanting to know what happened before. And a lot of that was established through our relationship. So my question is... What intrigues you about history to where you want to continuously look into um, what happened, you know, prior to, to today? Um, you know, so I have a story that a, a buddy of mine, my best friend, when we were in the sixth grade, um, this is when I really first got introduced to Egypt, you know, and Egypt being actually a part of Africa, you know, mm -hmm. and those and those people that erected that civilization being, you know, black Africans. Right, right. right. And me and my teacher got into it, you know. We, uh, <laughs> you know, she was talking about Mesopotamia and stuff, and I was like, you know, the research that I've conducted says that, you know, some things that occurred in Egypt was prior to, and mm -hmm. and it was it was at that point that was in the sixth grade that I was like, huh, it's something particular about the stories that they tell us, mm. and it's also something particular about the stories that they tell us that they're not telling the whole story. Yeah. You know, yeah. and so history has always been taught in silos where everything jumps around or you go from one thing and you jump over here. You're like, how do we get over here? Right. How do we go from, from Sumeria to China to, to, you know, back to Africa to India? Like, why are we jumping around? And nobody had a real good chronological, you know, order of, of, of history and how things really occurred. Right. And so that just sent me on a path, man. And it's, I mean, it's still going on today. But, <laughs> you know, it's a path that, um, I don't know, it just really started me. To really start to delve into the fact that a lot of black contributions all around the world are left off of that historical register. Right. You know, and so in my first book, I remember getting this book in the eighth grade. It was uh, African Origins of Civilization by Cheek Atta Diop. And um, come to find out, he's like one of the greats. You know, he did a lot of great things to prove a lot of things that people are still questioning today. Like, I don't even know why we're still questioning this. He proved it in the 60s or whatever. But right. Uh, but that book was like this thick, mm. and it intimidated me. And so I never read the whole thing. I used it as a reference tool, you know, because everybody referenced him. And he had done everything, and so everybody went back to him as the, the main source. Right. And so it was another book called uh, What They Never Taught You in History Class mm. uh, by Indus Chemist uh, Kamit. And even his name, I was like, Indus, you know, these are that's a river in India. Kush, you know, that's a civilization in Africa. Right. And then Kamit, you know, that's one of the original names of Egypt. And so I was like, this is, okay, let me pick this up. And all his book was was a um, a bunch of clips and and and, and highlights and, and clippings of other books mm. proving, mm. like, all of these things, like creators of mathematics. And they go back to the oldest African, you know, um, papers where they, you know, doing, I'm talking about high-level mathematics, you right. know. Um, and it was just a bunch of clippings, clippings. So I, what I did was the clippings that he put, you know, he always had the source. I would go buy those books, you know, and I just started building a library and start thinking. And so when I got to Xavier, um, I was a biology premier major. If, if, <laughs> if you could believe, <laughs> if, if you could believe it, now the, 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 the best thing that came out of that is that I met my wife, you know, yeah. she graduated with a biology you know, degree, Yes, sir. Uh, but I changed my major. First semester of my freshman year and went yeah. into history, you know, and my school was known for their biology program. Right. Not so much their history program, but I learned from a lot of good individuals, you know, how to um, continue this, uh, you know, this idea of being a historian, you know, yeah. and what you want to bring across to people. And so yeah. I've that's been running the, ever since. That's the, I, I can see. I can <laughs> see because there is this there is definitely the reality of not having a full picture. Yes. Right. And. You know, even when you think about a circle, it's 360 degrees, but when you think about someone's perspective on that circle, it's going to be limited just based off of the fact that they don't have eyes behind them, yes. right? 
But unfortunately, we've seen stories to where, no, you saw that, you just ain't say nothing. <laughs> yes. Yes. And we, you realize that now more in America here. <laughs> That's right. That's exactly right. <laughs> That's exactly right. And I, and I think some, there's no think. A lot of what is being discussed today is being brought to light because of tools that we have to see what happened. Instead of us having to go to a right. library, right. we can Google it. Hold on. Yeah. Let me check yeah. the source. Because there's a few things that you shared that were actually some uh, free jewelry, and I hope y'all picked it up. Charles looked at a particular piece of information in a book, very informative, saw the source, and then picked up the book of the source. Yes. You know what I'm saying? And so instead of looking at the information at its face value, let me see where that came from, and then let me pick up that original source to validate what I just picked yes, up yes. in this book. Young right? people, listen to that. Did you hear that? <laughs> <laughs> you, you broke it down way better than I did, but that's you know that's an old tool. You're right. That's you know, right. People don't do that no more. I remember the de uh, the uh, deci decibel, or you know the thing you had to yeah. do in the library. I know, right. I know I probably said that wrong, but um, you know you had to go in there and search for something. Right. You know you had to pull out those encyclopedias. Right. Right, that's you know, right. Get that's information, right. and so even even young people today, when I go out and I speak to young people, I tell them that their greatest skill right now mm. is going to be able to decipher internet information. Yeah, that's you know, right. Just because it's at the top of that Google search doesn't mean that it's the most proper, most correct. That's thing. Exactly right. You know, and so you got to go delve into that, do a little more research, see where they're getting their stuff from. Right. And then do a little more, that's see right. where they're getting their stuff that's from. That's exactly right. And then, you know, that's how you kind of get on this path. And, and and even now, man, you can start doing that, and you'll realize that at some point, um, especially in, like, medical books. Yeah. Or, like, or like university textbooks. Yeah. You know, those books that was written in the early 1900s, late 1800s, mm -hmm. you know, they have that racial, you know, racist twist yeah. in their education as well. Right. Right, you know, right, and right. these were people that were teaching doctors, and these That's were teaching right. other people that were educating the masses. That's right, you That's know, right. Or, right. or 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 working on the masses. That's right. And so th this is why we have to know this history. That's exactly. And right. get right, you know, get really into it. It's funny you said that, and I I um I was actually talking to someone yesterday about this. Um, it's the young I don't, I cannot remember her name. You may know her name off 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 rip, but the the young lady that helped document the last interview. Uh, uh, essentially, of the descendants um, uh, that were tied to the Cl Clotilda, I forget. Oh yes, um, I, I don't know. I don't. I know who you talk about. Though, and I believe I that there was a documentary that. that's been released. Uh, Zora, Zora Neale Hurston. There we go. Yes, and yes. I, and I believe she went to school for anthropology. Yes, she did, and then she just traveled throughout the nation writing about people's cultural um, experiences in America. Yeah, you know, right. they talk about America being a, you know, a, melt, a melting pot. Right. You know, we know that that's not really true, <laughs> but, but she went around and showed how, you know, the Appalachians, how they function. You know, she came into the deep South right. and the thing was to capture those cultural things, language, yeah. food, yeah. you know, and then, yeah, she was one of the people that was able to, uh, interview, uh, Kudjo. You know, yeah. we always say Cujo, but that's not correct. It's Cudjo, and I just learned that recently. Yeah. Um, Cudjo Lewis, and I was able to meet some of his descendants. Right. You know, right. and 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 she and she took down that oral history basically in the book. Right. For the uh for the Cotilda, and you know they found that ship. Mm -hmm. That ship was uh last sailed, and I want to say eighteen sixty one, sixty two. Mm. This is during the Civil War. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So. <laughs> Uh, this is the kind of stuff that you know people think that things ceased, right? Right. Yeah. The 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 importation of of slaves in America is supposed to have ceased in 1808. This so is when, 1860, 61. So it's 50 some years. So imagine, imagine, imagine um, you're on the highway, and the speed limit says 65. Right. And they drop the speed limit down to 35. But over the next 50 years, folks are still driving 65, 65 and, right, not right, right, right. and not getting pulled over. And not getting pulled over. And not getting pulled over. All right. Yes. All right. So, I mean, so, that's the right. <laughs> so even when we look at the source, and, and, and we see this even in the financial world, you'll see a poll that says 75% of Americans, blah, 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 blah. Who'd you poll? And right. I'll look up the. Right. Man, you pulled, you, you pulled 300 people. Right. How do you know 75% of Americans or. Right. Eighty-two, like so. We, even when we see these metrics around finances and and on information, look at the source because nine times out of ten, the platform you're receiving it on has a slight 
needed perspective yes. to get you to understand it from their perspective right. because there is a end goal that may be tied to revenue for them. And so, uh, see, look, y'all just got a little bit of history on that. And we, we, we done went down to Mobile for you real quick. <laughs> yeah. Shout out to Mobile. Yeah, shout them out. Shout out to everybody in the Africa state. Africa Town. That's exactly right. Africa Town. So, one of the folks that we are going to talk about today, and I'm actually going to put my phone up here. One of the folks we're going to talk about today um, is a Birmingham hero, Fred Shuttlesworth. And I think it will be helpful for those because what I've seen just from our platform, we got folks all across the country that's tapped in. Yes. Um, we got my people down in Florida. We got folks up north on the West Coast and their perspective of Birmingham is typically through the lens of First 48. <laughs> <laughs> Who got shot in this right, right. You know what I'm saying, look, man? Not you, look, saying, Birmingham man. ain't no joke. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it is unfortunate, and that's also an economic situation. Cause, yes. Because most crime is tied to money at yes. the end of the day. Now, we yes. do got a lot of cats out here that they feel like their confidence is tied to their ability to do something tough, and they pulling pistols out when they, you know, Bro, you can't even wrestle for 12 seconds because you ain't in shape. And so, right. like, there's certain things that um, when it pertains to, like, conflict resolution and, and knowing how to deal with your emotions that, unfortunately, the media captures areas a lot heavier than most. And I believe Birmingham is one of those areas, even though the reality is there's a lot of crime that's happening in Birmingham, mm -hmm. specifically when it pertains to, um, uh, we'll just say, shootings and, and, and things of that nature. But at the same time, it's not just Birmingham. It's all across the country. Yes. It's just how things are highlighted in this particular area. And so, unfortunately, the Birmingham picture is either, um, hey, man, all that crazy stuff went down over there, man. I, don't, I feel like, you know, and they still got the clan down there. Well, they probably do. They may dress different. Um, <laughs> or it's just through the lens of the first 48. Right, right. right. Now, when we think about this particular hero we're going to discuss, which is Fred Shuttlesworth, can you give just an overview of what Birmingham was like in the 50s and 60s? Oh, man. So I love talking about Fred first. So let me say that. Excuse me. A little, little under the weather today. But, uh, you know, Birmingham was considered the most oppressive, segregated city of its size uh, during the segregation era. Mm. You can consider the segregation era to ultimately be in from 1896 when Plessy versus Ferguson was passed and said that segregation is okay as long as you have you know separate accommodations for each you know race or whatever. Um, you know, all the way up until, you know, <laughs> You know, it's still segregated. That's you know, yeah, to be honest, but right. Yeah, that's right. I'm sorry. Uh, you know, yeah, but you're right. It's, it's it's still segregated. But you know, people consider the 1964 uh, Civil Rights Act to be the ending of you know that era, that period. Um, and the 40s, 50s, and 60s were probably the most turbulent time here in the city of Birmingham. Mm -hmm. You know, Birmingham has a nickname called Bombingham, mm. and that's not for any, you know, slight reason. This is a steel town, and the Ku Klux Klan used dynamite as one of their favorite weapons. Mm. You had over 50 unsolved bombings from the 40s to the 60s in this city. Um, you know, you have areas of town around here called Dynamite Hill. And and, and even on the, the fact of bombings, right, you, when you think about bomb, you think about war. Yeah. You don't even, you don't even, when's the last time someone is, like literally, when's the last time you've witnessed something being bombed in person? In I, your city. Okay, when's the last time you've heard of something being bombed where you grew up, where you currently are in the last 10 years? What was that, um... Bombing of the abortion clinic out here. Now, that was still out here. That was in Birmingham. Yeah, so, look at that. Look, right. <laughs> so that just that just kind of goes right. to show the history, you know, and how those things can kind of play out later on right. uh, in our society. But that doesn't you don't hear that. And and isn't it the three natural ingredients you need to create a bomb? We have them here in Birmingham well, for steel. For steel. Okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. The, okay. uh, that's why Birmingham is 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 a town that uh, is a steel town, but it was very prosperous. Steel town because yeah. all three ingredients to make steel are locally steel. available. Yep, that's and right. you don't you don't usually see that in most other steel towns. They have to import something in. Right, right. You know? And right. so because of that though, Birmingham had a lot of money. 
Yeah. You had people who, you know, certain people who control this town. Right. And then come to find out, you know, those people who had that money and controlled this town, they're the ones who pushed Bull Carter to be who he was. Ooh, so let's you know, get into it. So we can get into who let's Bull get Carter into, was. Let's but, get into it. But, you know, yeah. Bull Carter was that, you know, he took over in the 30s. And he refused to leave office in 1963 when he was outed as as he tried to run for mayor. This is what's interesting about this um, perspective, but also the reality and this factual information that we're hearing about Birmingham. Because when you hear the name Bull Connor and you learn more about what he was responsible for, it is going to be surprising to hear that. Hold on, hold on. Who do you work for? So, <laughs> what was that? So, little, little, little history so, about yeah, tell, Bull. Yeah, so, tell just, about just, Bull. So, his name is the- Theopolis <laughs> Bull Carter. Um, but you know, he 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 originally was a um, a game caller at at Rick Field. Okay. So he would call games for the for the Birmingham Barons. He would call games for the Birmingham Black Barons. But when he called these games for the Birmingham Black Barons, he would use racial. You know, epithets and things. He would say, like, if somebody hit it, a home run out into uh, one of the black sex, you know, uh, out in the alpha, he would say stuff like, you know, oh, he hit that into the coal mines and things like that. Uh, and so that's how he started to generate a name for himself. Okay? Uh, and then so with that, he ran for um, a city commissioner and became the uh, commissioner of public safety. Now, we always say, you know, uh, Commissioner of Public Safety was over the fire department, the police department. That's true, but he was also over transportation and schools. Wow. Okay? And so one of the other things that Bull is, um, should be famous for, really a lot of people don't know about, is in the, um, the oh, I'm not sure exactly what year it is. I want to say it was in the 40s. Uh, but when it was the Democrat National Convention, and the Democratic National Convention wanted to adopt civil rights issues as part of their platform. And Bull Connor led a walkout of that convention that led to the, the creating of the Dixiecrats. Okay, which is that sub the real southern, right. deep southern Democrat, you know, right. racist right. folks. You right. know. Um, and they even ran somebody for president. You know, they <laughs> ran um uh Thurman for president. And so um, wow. those are things that, you know, that's big. he was a stunt segregationist. Yeah. You know? uh, he even he even had a black man lynched in his uniform in the 40s that came back from World War II trying to register people to vote. So you got to see, and 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 Fred is not from here, you know, during this time. He's from Mount Meigs, Alabama. That's, that's down by Montgomery. You know, he happens to do a speaking engagement for a buddy of his who's also a preacher, at Bethel Baptist Church in 53 here in Birmingham who just happened to be looking for a pastor. Because the pastor that was supposed to speak didn't want to go speak, he asked Fred to do it for him. Fred went and spoke. They liked what Fred was doing. And so they offered him the pastorship. This is in 53. You know, Fred becomes um, the state membership coordinator of the M- NAACP for the state of Alabama. Mm. You know, he, he, he he's, he's asking his congregation to become members of the NAACP, to register to vote. How old is he around state. this time? Oh, man, how old is Fred around this time? He, I want to say he's in his, so he was a little older than King when, when all this stuff got rolling. So 53, he's probably in his in his 30s, I want to say. Yeah. I'm not exactly the sure the age, yeah. but you know, he, he yeah. had already been in the military. Yeah. You know, he had already been in college. He had already done some things, you know. Mm. So he's, he, he's, he's a little older. Uh, but still young. Still yeah, still young. Still young. You yeah. know, this is early yeah. 30s, you know. You, yeah. Still young man. Right, right, you know? right, right, yeah, right. Yeah, uh, my mind jumps around really nah, crazy. Nah, and, and, I, and you yeah, know this, yeah, but yes, sir. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, Tupac talks about how uh, when it's time for people to be active in their mm-hmm. communities, when yeah. it's time for people to be um, out there, you know, kicking up dust, as, as he would say, or, right. you know, really out there trying to make change in this world. And he's like, you got to do that when you're younger. Yeah. You know, when, yeah. you, when you, you do that when you're younger, you're, because you have that energy, right? And, you know, and you're, and, you're, and you're still molding, you know, certain things, but you have that energy and that drive and those things, you know. Right. And so that's why, even with the civil rights movement, that's why those 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 college students, mm. you know, were the ones that they targeted. And, he, and here in Birmingham, even younger than that, right? You know, because this was just just an oppressive place. You had to do something out of the box, yeah, right, to make it work here, you know. Right. And so, uh, and Fred, you know, he led those efforts. And so, so, so we got 
And it's <coughs> it's interesting the the role media has played in division, but also you know getting people together. You know, hearing how Bull ultimately, you know, he was able to make his sly comments yeah. during the baseball games, but he was also able to build an audience. Audience, yeah. Right? And so and we see that now the folks they may they they may say something that's just like, man, that's what? that's messed right. up. And now you done built an audience. Yeah. Yeah. Um the second thing is one, how he was able to essentially influence policy yes. in some forms of fashion just based off of his beliefs, and I think probably some of the takeaways, especially for a younger art, uh, audience, is because one thing that I did not have anything on was voting. Like, man, I don't, yeah, that stuff don't yeah. even work, right? I was right? like that. Like, it, yeah, they still gonna do it. But we can see specifically at the local level the impact they have on certain yes. decisions, and I think we'll be able to learn more about that into um, in different spaces. And so we got Fred then came up to Birmingham because the pastor did not want to preach. Um, um, during that particular time, Fred comes up to to essentially Bethel. They rock it with him, they, right? They like what he's doing. Yo, we hey, we want you to come on board. So he's not from Birmingham. Now he's in Birmingham, right? So let's talk about how Fred essentially manifested in Birmingham and some of the things that he spoke on, and then we'll be able to get to okay. you know, you know, really his journey because there is going to be a situation where it's. Bull Connor and Fred Shaw's yeah, work. Yeah, and there it's like, you know, uh Superman versus the villain. <laughs> right. Know? Um, but you know, basically Fred seeing the kind of town that Birmingham is and how the people of Birmingham were so oppressed that people were scared to step up and do something. Mm. You know, and, and not to say that there wasn't resistance in Birmingham behind certain things, because you know, black people have been resistant right. you know, from the beginning. But let's talk about some of that oppression. Okay. So um Usually when we think about, like, we look at someone else's situation, let's say 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 30 years ago, 100 years ago, we naturally look at the things that we have in common. So the first thing is, like, okay, I got a job, they got a job. So when we look at, like, wage and income, because oppression comes in multiple forms, right? And so... You know, was there wage inequality around this time? Like, what what was how did how did folks make money in Birmingham? Wow, uh, major wage, you know, uh, um, difference between the between the races. Uh, but you know, this being a steel town, you know, that was a means for a lot of people to get a good, you know, good yeah. working job and make some good money. But you know, as a black person, you only got um, what they call helper wages. You know? mm. um, so you might have been doing machinist work, you know, but instead of getting paid as a machinist, you get paid as a machinist helper. Mm. You know, and so it was means and, and ways that they they kept African Americans from being able to be able to you know make those same uh, type of wages. If you were a black woman at this time, oh man, it was you know yeah. it was even worse. Um, but one of the things that you know Birmingham and and some other players in the South, but Birmingham was known for was also the convict leasing. You know, mm. and, and because they were able to leverage the convict leasing system, it was a means for them to keep working folks that weren't involved in the in the uh you know criminal justice system for being able to make a living wage. So convict leasing. So let's talk about one of the ways in which someone would be um <laughs> under that type of servitude. So let let's let's um so let's say you walking down the street. Right. <laughs> uh, it's nine thirty in the morning, right? Right. Like, you know what? Woke up. Let's say you went on a jog around the block, right? Something like, like something hey, simple. something simple. You finishing up your jog. You know, you're like, all right, let me let me go to a local grocery store or something like that. You 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 are literally walking down the street, right? Right. And let's just say you got a melon account like mine, and you got a little chocolate to you, right? Right. right. And there was someone across the street that does not look like you. Oh, you may be on the same sidewalk. Um, you scoot over to the side. You continue to walk. Um, could that get you in jail? Like, could you get locked up for that? What if What if you just looked at him? Like, so it's <laughs> so you know. We learned in school one of the things that you know. I did learn in school at some point. You know, I relearned it here at the institute. But you know, you had two two functions of how segregation, Jim Crow laws, and things work. You know, um, the jury de facto. You know, the jury were things that were actual by law. Okay. Um, de facto were things that were by custom. Mm. You know, and so a lot of times the things that were by custom could get you in trouble 
but they wouldn't get the law involved. So those are the lynchings. Those are the Ooh. people who just, you know, disappear. You never see them again kind of right, things, you know? Right, right, right. Um, the the jury things that were actually by law, those were things like vagrancy, okay? So so vagrancy is like you could be walking down the street or whatever and a police officer rolls up on you and, and, and stops you and, and asks you to pull out some money. If you don't have any money in your pocket, a particular amount of money in your pocket, they considered you without a job. Mm. You were considered a vagrant, and then they would railroad you through the system. Right. Those people that got railroaded through those systems like that also end up disappearing. Yeah. You know, a lot of times wives looking for their husbands. You know, we always hear the stories. You know, my daddy went out for a pack of cigarettes. You know, we always think that that person went. So, you know, I'm not saying that those things didn't happen. Right. But these things happen as well. Right. I went right. to the store for a pack of cigarettes, and they, you know, he didn't come back. You know, it's a very good. Uh, uh, documentary and book called Slavery by Another Name mm. that talks about this, you know, mm. and these people would turn up missing. These owners of these mines or these foremen or whatever would go to these wardens or these jails and they would say, you know, let me get 15 guys, pay a certain fee per head, and they take them and work them in these mines and these mills and these things in this area. <clears throat> and so and that was a way for them to get cheap labor right. because of that clause in the 13th Amendment. Yeah. Right? 13th Amendment says that slavery is abolished unless as punishment for a crime. Mm. They use it's in the Constitution. Yeah. You know? They use that as a that clause right. as a means to be able to do this right. and get cheap labor again. Right. 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 Um and so Birmingham was notorious for that. Mm-hmm. And um and so these people made a lot of money. By not having to pay out a lot of, you know, labor and wages. And look, wages. The right. one, the number one. You look at. Um, uh, there's a platform called EDGAR. You can look at the business financials of companies all across the globe because they got a publisher, especially if they're publicly traded companies. Right. If you look at their balance sheet, their profit and loss statement, you look at all the financials. The one of the biggest expense, if if it's not the largest. Is going to be wages. Employees. It's going to be right. the people you pay. And so if you are able to get the same output with 40% less in expenses, Ooh. imagine what that does to your bottom line. And so, um, and that's why I wanted to tie in the how easily someone could get into that convict leasing type of situation based off of some of the customs, you know what I'm saying, right. or some of the ways in which they justify someone not being the type of human right. they uh, see as equal, right. right? And so they create, all right. Um, all right, so we have this, we have the convict Lisa situation in regards of when we look at like the overall status of Birmingham, right? We have uh, a lot of folks making money because of the natural ingredients to be able to make steel here in Birmingham. Yes. Um, now there is more attention on what's happening in Birmingham, but Fred is is seeing real time what's happening and saying, all right, I want to start making change. What are some of the initial steps he made that put him on the map? Because, you know, one thing that I, I was able to learn about Fred is that the people in Birmingham was rocking with him. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like he 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 had he definitely had a following. How was he able to build that following on standing really in areas that folks were, you know, either scared to stand themselves? Well, you know, as as Fred started to get, you know, so everybody knows about Emmett Till, you know. Mm. And that was one of those things that kind of was one of the straws that broke, you know, the camel's back right. for black people across this country. And so uh, seeing that and then the Montgomery bus boycott yep. started, Fred is right in the midst. You yeah, know, he's in the midst of all of that. He was the state coordinator, of the NAACP. The NAACP was the was the the you know the organization that helped the the Montgomery Improvement Association run that boycott. Mm. And so Fred is involved, so he's seeing what's going on, and he's thinking like, oh yeah, it, it's you know the time is now. Right. You know we're gonna end segregation. Uh, we're gonna get this country to live up to all the things that it wrote down in that constitution. Right. You know, the black people, we're gonna get this. You know? Right. And so Fred is starting to lead these. Um, you know, I'm sorry, she's starting to be involved yeah. in these movements, you know. Um, due to the success of the Montgomery bus boycott, you know, the state of Alabama outlawed the NAACP. 
the NWCU was not allowed to function in this state for several years. Wow. You know, and Fred seeing that, he does some research and, and finds out that the state can't outlaw a religious organization. And so he starts the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights. This is what keeps the movement going. Like, I try to get people to understand this now on my tours and stuff. Yeah. I try to break it down so as, you know, elementary as I can, but in a way that people understand that these people are understanding what these black people are trying to do. They're literally trying to stop the civil rights movement in its tracks. Yeah. Right? Yep. If we outlaw the NAACP, that should stop That's just, yeah, you that's know, right. That's if, right. Uh, if, if we do this, that should stop them. Right. You know, the first time they tried to stop it was in the middle of the bus boycott with... Uh, uh, trying to charge people carpooling as 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 functioning as taxis without a license, <laughs> right? That's the other time they tried to stop it, and, you know. And it was Birmingham that came to rescue that. Wow. Okay, so Birmingham is intricate in this history, um, and so they're trying to stop this movement, right? And they don't really know how, right. but they're trying everywhere they can. So they go legally and they outlaw the NAACP. So Fred starts the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights. That's a religious organization. He takes that civil word out of there and goes a step further. Right. Right? Because civil rights is now becoming a hotbed kind of word, you know. Right. Take that out. Let's keep this thing going. Look at the strategy. So Right, that's another thing, strategy. Just just to and I think even us as people, whatever we feel like we are on this earth to do. We should be so committed towards that particular item change, regardless of what's in front of us. We implement the type of innovation, strategy, thought pattern that allows us to still change whatever that may be. And so for him to say, okay, touche. Let me read this. Right. Let me see. I see okay. what you're doing. Yeah, let me and which is the importance of knowing the source. Right. Right? Not allowing because there were probably other folks that lost hope because they banned the NAACP. Yeah, they were like, oh, it's over. And so it's over now. It's over. That was a part of the movement that believed. You gotta go to it. another state. Right. We, yeah, know, it's, it's, it's done. It's done. You said, yeah. no, 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 no. Right. This change gonna happen here. We just gotta be a little bit more creative. So right. shout man, shout out to the I, I yeah. just had to Yeah, strategy. And just thinking, you know, thinking things through, having meetings, consulting individuals, you know, really, really making it a team effort and and like you said before, Fred, this is Fred starting to garner the support. Yeah, yeah. You know, during this time period, they say that they say that there was over eight hundred churches in Birmingham, but it was sixty churches that was a part of the of the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights. Ooh. So those sixty churches led this this push, you know. <laughs> and one of the first things that um that Fred, you know, as he started to get you know this kind of target on his back, right? You know, is um, his house is bombed. Okay, so 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 here we go. It's about to get juicy. <laughs> so all of my married men out there, and for those that have children as well, specifically girls, um, imagine. Well, let's let's back up because I because there he told them what he was going to do. Yeah. So. Let's talk about the event that led him uh, to essentially market, hey, y'all, we, we about to do X, Y, and Z. And ultimately, those that did not agree with that movement, they said, well, we got something for you as well. So, right. yeah, get what what led to them saying, yo, stick some dynamite under this house? So, you know, uh, as you kind of see things playing out, so the movement, you know, the Montgomery bus boycott has now ended, um, and you have – the NAACP moving to other states to start to conduct, you know, their own campaigns. You have Fred um, and the uh, Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights conducted things in the city of Birmingham. And so Fred, you know, he had already had things started, you know. Yeah. Things, you know, a um, couple, couple of things were little, you know, little boycotts and sit-ins and things of that nature. Um, but it was him, you know, uh, attempting to integrate his own children. That's right. Into school that really started to put that that target on his back, uh, you know. But that's 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 in '57. But you know, so if in December of '56 is when his house is actually bombed, mm. you know. And so and so some of the things that he did prior to that, 
you know, one of those things that, you know, registering people to vote, you know, yeah. um, um, you know, getting the word about things that Bull Carter's doing that he shouldn't be doing. Right. You know? Right. Um, and, and really just trying to change uh, life for black people in the city of Birmingham just as a whole. Right. You know, and you see things changing because what happened in Montgomery went all the way to the Supreme Court mm. and made change. They said it was unconstitutional for the city, you know, and so. The planning of testing those bus, you know, the, that um, that law that just came down and said Absolutely. that segregated seating is, is unconstitutional. Right. They tried to kill Fred yeah. the day before. So, Stop something like that from happening. So the simplicity. Now, there are other impacts that Fred was having to where they were like, all right, we got to do something. We got to watch this. We got to do something. Right. Like this stuff bro. going on. Right. Right. But, but just the simplicity of. Someone walking on a bus, and let's say they are they have to use a cane. Ah, man, there's a seat right here. Uh, no, sir, can't sit right there. Can't sit right there. Yeah, go all the way back there. Just for him to say that's that's not that's not right. Folks say, yo, go get sixteen sticks of dynamite and put that up under his house. I don't care if his kids or wife or anything. Right, they don't care about. I don't anything. care nothing about that. I don't care about anything. And then, so one of the things that Fred was. Will go down in history as is that how he used the courts. Yeah. So one of the things that just popped in my memory was hold on, that. hold on, hold on. Before you go there, before you go there. <laughs> so, sixteen sticks of dynamite. It goes off. So it ain't just sit there and go off. No, and he no, no. found the dynamite. Like, oh, they try to blow no, no, me no, up. No, no, no. It goes off. And if I remember the story correctly, he's in his bed. Yeah. He gets lifted out of his bed. Comes back down, yeah. thing is in a ray. He's checking on his family, making right. that's fire, what fire right, around. Right, stuff. right. You're that. You're home uh, again. Oh, Christmas Day. Uh, oh, see, look, we <laughs> and this is not 1890. Right. It's not 1920. It's 19 what 56. 56. 1956. You have a family member that was alive during that time frame that's alive right now. Oh yeah. His home was bombed. His family was in there. Not, oh, yeah, we know he's in there. We got his family, his children was in there. Yeah. Where was he the next day? He was on that bus testing those laws. That's a bad boy. Uh, he, yeah, look, that's, that's a bad boy. A, but look, this is also what solidified his leadership. You know, they, uh, those, you know, recent information on that bomb that I heard was that, you know, it took a, it took a while for Fred to get his wife and his children out. And that a crowd of neighborhood folks had formed. And they're and they're like, oh my God, they killed Fred. You know, like, oh my God, they killed Fred. Like, what are we gonna do? Like, you know, because you know, sometimes Birmingham wanted to erupt. You know, and and so when Fred emerges, yeah, 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 a lady yeah. says, you know, God saved Fred to lead the movement. Mm. And so that's part of what solidified his leadership. Yeah. You know, so it's like, what are we gonna do next, Fred? Right. What are we gonna do next? Are we right. getting on them buses tomorrow anyway? Right. You know, and so pictures that we have at the institute. Have Fred in this in this overcoat, man. It's just like swallowing him. Yeah, <laughs> swallow him. You're like, yeah, I know you didn't get it. You, know, you 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 a bad preacher. I know you didn't get that, Taylor. Yeah, man. Yeah. You know, <laughs> he, all his clothes. He lost his clothes at the blast. Yeah, and so somebody was like, man, I got something you could wear. You know, yeah. and he had yeah. to wear somebody else's clothing. Yeah, but he's on that bus. He's yeah. testing those laws. Yeah, you know, he got a sympathetic crew of people that came with him. Right, you know, but one of the things I think also put a target on Fred's back is that he started to try to use the courts. To break segregation. Yeah. And then one of the things he did was that, you know, every night, at you know, you had 60 different churches. Every night for the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights, the meetings would be Monday night at a different church. Mm. Fred had filed an injunction with the city to try and keep Birmingham PD police officers out of their meetings. Mm. You know, because they were always there. So they always knew what he was going to do. Yeah. You know, he, yeah. they always knew they were there. Right. You right. know, and so he tried to get them out of those meetings. Right. Previous to the Bobby. Right. You know, and then after that, he tried to, you know, integrate his child in the Phillips High yep. School. Yep. Yep. And then he was met with a mob there. And that was a setup. You know, that was that was kind of that was crazy in of itself. So you got because I it, it was it both daughters or just one. I think at that time it was one that was high school. Well, yeah, age. one, yeah, yeah. And so imagine pulling up to a school. So I just, I just, I want y'all to empathize with these, with these. This efforts. is crazy. So my oldest daughter just started high school, wow. ninth grade. Wow, wow. 
imagine because Phillips, that wasn't too far from where he lived. No. No, nah, that wasn't one far. No. Yeah, school down the street, right? Not that far at all. Imagine pulling up to the school. And even before you put the car in park, there are people looking at you, and you know for a fact they don't want you there. Right. The point of school is for education. Yeah. I'm, I came here to learn. This is a safe space. That's why when something happens at school, you if there's right. a shooting or something like that, everybody everybody drop what they're doing to make right. sure. It, it's kids. Right. They, they are off limits. So you're a parent. You pull up to a school. You have your child. And your wife is with you saying, you know what? We want this type of teaching as well, because unfortunately, during that same time, the education, of course, was different. If you went to a black school or a white school, school, right? The materials are different. Right. The quality of the materials are different. Right. And oftentimes the materials at the black schools were passed down from the white schools. And you may have 80 pages of the book missing. Yeah. Yeah. Intentionally. Yeah. Right. And so. We want something different. They deserve they deserve something different. They get out the vehicle. You said they're met with the mob. Now, they ain't just show up and just, hey, get out of here, boy. They came with some brass knuckles. Yeah. Some weapons. Weapons. Pipes. Knives. Chains. And from my understanding, Fred didn't get stabbed. Someone got stabbed. Wasn't it wife? His wife got stabbed in the hip. Yeah. Trying to go to school. Trying to go to school. Just enroll your child in school. Oh, okay. you know? I'm just... Daughter's ankle was broken. You know, so, <laughs> you know, Fred was roughed up pretty bad that, you know, that day as well. You know, right. and, you know, there's footage of it. It was a young man that just graduated Birmingham Southern College mm. who was there to uh, interview for a job. But he was a photography major or something like that. So he had a little camera. So when he pulled up, he sees the crowd too. He's like, I wonder what's going on. He pulls his camera out and he sees everything going. He starts filming. You see Fred trying to dodge and, you know, slip, you know, people's punches and stuff. And you see him fall down and you see everybody's foot. I mean, it's crazy. Everybody seems like everybody's foot raises up to try to stomp him. How, somehow he pops back up on his feet. You know, he kind of runs out the way. Fred, no kid athlete. Man, look. <laughs> look. And, 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 and hearing him tell the story, he's just like, you know, I'm just trying to not, you know, be not necessarily fight back, but just try to get, you know, get out of the way and stuff. Right. And, and uh, somebody pulled up in the car. They hopped in. You know, and that's when his daughter's ankle got broken. Trying to hop in the back of the car. But yeah, his wife gets stabbed in the hip. That night, they have images of Fred with his arm in a sling and looking all roughed up. Yeah. And stuff. But you know, one of the things that he wanted to show uh, his people, the you know, or the black people of Birmingham, just as a whole, was that he was willing to be a front line soldier. Yeah. You know, he, yeah. He's not. He's not. He's not gonna ask anybody to do anything he's not willing to do. Right. You know, right. he's not gonna tell you to do something like, okay, you know, he's gonna sit up here like, you know, I orchestrated that, you know. Right. He's that's not the kind of leader he was. He right. was gonna be down there getting beat. Yeah. He, you know, he, on the front line. Right. You know, that's especially right. for this city. That's right. That's you know? right. Man, Fred, Fred, Fred Shuttle's work, the more I've learned, and again, that's why I'm so appreciative of Charles because you know, my perception of leadership evolved once I learned more about what Fred sacrificed. Um, because even when you hear the stories about him getting beat, his wife getting stabbed, his home being bombed, you naturally, I naturally, let me speak for myself, I naturally was like, I'm putting my hands on everybody. Everybody going to have to get it. Yeah. And for him to have a vision that did not allow his current emotions to dictate his actions during that yeah. time, that's a bad brother. Yes. We typically grade someone's, um, uh, we'll say, ability to be a man based off of, oh, how much weight you lift and how... Vi-. No, 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 no. It, 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 right. It's more so how you represent yourself in times in which folks think something different, right. you know, and... Um, and I and I and I'm thoroughly appreciative of one why it's important to make sure you can get as much of the perspective as possible because you mentioned something and I believe and I gotta I gotta finish it. Shout out to Marie King in a group with the Shuttlesworth documentary. Mm-hmm. But I believe that same cameraman, that gentleman that actually he, cameraman, that gentleman that went there for the interview, I believe it was his photos were the photos that we've been able to witness and didn't that like travel? Um, 
uh, to like a rotary member to where like it brought light to some of the injustices in Birmingham. And that's kind of what started some of, you know, really the 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 white colleagues and, right. and the white community to be more involved because someone was able to deploy empathy hmm. that wasn't influenced by their community. Right. He was by himself. He saw a picture. Right. Empathy, right? Okay. And he reacted. Um, so just even the power of, to your point, knowing your history but not being, not taking a situation from one perspective and saying this is a full picture, right. but getting as many perspectives as possible right. to form your own picture, mm -hmm. right? Um before before we get up out of here, one thing I definitely want to talk about was um, Fred's consistency on challenging policy. Um, but one of the success uh, stories of that is how people travel. So, um, so of course we know the Shuttlesworth Airport. One would say, "Oh yeah, they should have." Yeah, Shuttlesworth Airport. What do you mean? Like he's a he's a right, hero. He's a hero. Yeah. How was he treated at the airport? Uh, uh, <laughs> not favorably at all. You know, uh, we have images and stuff in our in, in the galleries at the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute, uh, showing how Fred had to sue the airport. Oh, you know, he had to sue the airport, the limousine and taxi service at the airport, uh, because because they refused to serve him. Um, he also had some other infractions at the airport. <laughs> um, you know. I love Fred because one of you know one of his quotes was that he was either going to kill segregation or be killed by it. Mm. You know, and 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 what people don't understand is the reason why he's an unsung hero is because um, a lot of the stuff he was taking this on his own back. You know, not to say that you know the members of the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights weren't here with him or for him, uh, but he took a lot of these things on his back. And so while while the Little Rock Nine is integrating Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas, on par with what's going on in Birmingham as Fred is in, trying to in, integrate Phillips High School mm. himself. Right. You know, and so right. national attention is in Little Rock because, you know, the National Guard got called out and some other stuff. Right. But, you know, Fred's down here getting beat. Right. You know, no National Guard, no no federal assistance or anything, and he's taking this on his own shoulders. And mm. so, um, you know, he he had multiple, multiple litigation cases going on trying to break segregation in the city of Birmingham. Uh, he, you know, if you go to the Oral History Project with the uh, Birmingham Civil Rights Institute, you can see his oral history. It's five hours long, you know, but he tells you these stories and talks about some of these things. And so Fred is taking this movement on his back. He's moving it forward and dialing it forward, you know, all the way up until 1963 mm. where, you know, yeah, stuff hit the fan. Right, you know? right, 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 and then, right. And then things are blown up into a international proportion. Mm -hmm. You know, with the efforts that Fred, you know, strategized about bringing King here in '63. Right. So let, let's 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 definitely. So there's two things I definitely want to put a bow on. One is his role in connection to King and how that amplified King. And also, one of the aspects on King's journey before he was assassinated is that it was interesting. He started talking about money. Yes. Hey, hey, we got to get him up out of here, right? Yes. So, um, and even when we think about the civil rights movement, one of the things that is, I think, is another unsung hero in the, in the movement are those that had resources, just as you mentioned, Fred, I know that ain't your jacket. It's too big. Right. That was a resource. Now, it may not have been money out of the pocket, right? right? But there was a community of people that that made sure Fred was straight, mm -hmm. right? But also there were things that Fred did to make sure that he was straight economically as well to be able to um, do certain things, stand in certain places, and not be tied or bogged down because you know, I, I need to have enough money to be able to take care of my particular bills. Right. Um, so sp specifically, can you just speak on how Fred was an anchor in King's ability to be received internationally based off of the the uh, work done here in Birmingham? So, you know, um, Fred Shuttlesworth is a co-founding member of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. So he was right there at the beginning with King mm. and Abernathy in 56 when they decided to come up with this this overarching organization that would have other organizations come up under it to kind of keep these movements and these camp campaigns and things going. And so, you know, he, he was there for all of the strategies and all of right. these things, you know. Right. 
Um, and so they were in Albany, Georgia for some time and really didn't have uh, any great concessions. You know, they didn't really have any wins. Yeah. You know, and so Fred seeing this, you know, he's thinking like, you know, no, nah, we need to tackle something where you're going to get the kind of pushback right. that you need. You right, know? right. And knowing who Bull Connor is and how he is, mm -hmm. Fred knew that, you know, it's it's a good time to tackle Birmingham. Yeah. And Fred also understood the media and how the media worked, and he knew that right now where King went, you know, the media came as well. Mm -hmm. And he knew that he needed a media presence in the city of Birmingham to have the success that they needed, to see how bad Birmingham really was. Right. Now, I don't think he anticipated the dogs and the hoses and yeah. things of that nature. Right. Uh, but they knew that Bull would push back. Right. You know, whatever it was. You know, if it's arresting children or, you know, whatever whatever it was, they knew that he would push back. Because at first, they, I don't even think the concept of the children was the original concept. That was something right. that evolved in strategy as they went along. Right. You know, and they saw that the adults really weren't wanting to do what King was t talking about doing. Right. And so... Um, and this so, is in this is in this is in what year? This is starting in sixty two. Sixty. So it started in sixty two, going into sixty three. Sixty three. So this is when they they are starting to essentially execute some of the ideas um, in this time, and and this is, you know, for those that may have seen some of the the videos and the pictures to what Charles referenced to where you see dogs, German shepherds, you see the hoses. So this is a precursor to all that. Some of yes, the planning, yes, some of the planning and right, thinking behind right. it. You know, they called it called it Project C. C standing for confrontation. Mm. You know, and it was a means that they were going to go out, do selective buying campaigns, boycotts, and sit-ins and things uh, in the city of Birmingham to bring notoriety to what's considered, you know, the most segregated, you know, city yeah. of its size, you know, in this country. And so, um, I think Fred knew. That bull was gonna, you know, have some type of say about absolutely you know, what, what, what went on. Bull say, "Y'all ain't finna do this right nah, now." <laughs> no, not in my town, but you know, that's why I always, you know, it's, it's the superhero and the and, and the villain kind right. of thing. You know, you you, you know, Spider Man does something, and you wondering what you know Doctor Octopus is gonna do. And so, um, you know, Bull tried to meet them with what he thought was. So, Fisher, you're already using the children now to, to fill the jails. Mm. King is locked up. He's writing his letter from a Birmingham jail. Mm. You know, so Fred kind of has leeway to do, do things his way. Right. You know, and he's doing them. And he's getting it done. Um, so, King So King wasn't a fan of the kids being involved. No, not, not in the beginning. What was Fred's perspective on it? <laughs> I think Fred... He thought it was dangerous as well. Mm -hmm. I think, and I, and I think anyone that has children would be like, "I right, hold on now." You know what I'm saying? Like, all right, we we've dealt with them before. Right. We don't know how they're going to receive children. Are they going right. to see them as children? Or are they just going to see them as people with black skin? Right. And we, they saw them as people with black skin yes. as well. And, and, but you know, but the. <laughs> This is me talking. You know, kind of just yeah, analyzing these, yeah, that's right, right. Right, kind of <laughs> analyzing these situations and stuff. And Fred being a military man, mm. I think he saw the numbers and was like, "We can't. It's not like we can't do it." I mean, right. like, like leveraging the numbers of these young people who were enthusiastic about doing this thing. Oh, they loved it, man. They he loved was like it. we got to use that. Yeah, you know? we got to use that. And so they got student leaders and other folks that they know could garner crowds at their schools and stuff and. And sat them down and, and 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 talked about what they were thinking about doing. Yeah, you know, and the and the dangers of it. Yeah, what could happen, what might happen. But once again, I don't think anybody anticipated the idea about these dogs and these water hoses. And it, and this wasn't just Birmingham, like uh, the ninety nine communities within. Bur this is best folks coming from Bessemer, Bessemer Fairfield, Fairfield, Midfield, like here, yeah. every and 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 I, and I think what I've what I've always enjoyed about the story of Project C is that it was it was the kids. The kids. It it was the young people, yep. right? Like yep. there there really isn't an age limit to to make change. And and even their excitement on something that was criminal activity. They right. were like, yeah, yeah, you got locked up, I got locked up. You know, right, like just, right. They were excited. They, about knew it. That they were a part of the movement. Right. You know what I'm saying? And even even 
you know, hearing this and also I'm thinking about, you know, pro, the C representing confrontation. I was like, man, that C represents community. That C represents communication. That C represents, you know, cooperation. You right. know what I'm saying? And, and, and it's these elements of a community that I think that if it does not exist, it will it will naturally, naturally fray and not have a life. You know what I'm saying? Because there is no communication. Right. There is no cooperation. Right. right. There is no strategy. Right. There isn't someone that is aware of the policy. Right. There isn't a you know, so there, there is these elements of this story that we can use right now, implement in your family, implement in your company, implement within your organization. That um, that is just fast. It's, it's, it's fascinating, but also just the 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 role children can play in changing anything that is significant because mm -hmm. their mind hasn't been tarnished with, oh, you can't do that. Right. Be realistic. Mm -hmm. No, I'm being realistic. We finna, hey, we, you know, like, it's right. just, and, 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 and so um, I think that there is this energy that we can harness from young people. I say that like I'm 87. There's this energy Still, that we right. can harness from young folks that can help feed the solution that we want for the future. Yep. Um, and I and I just I you know, even hearing that, okay, so let's so we know how it went. I don't know if you want to land a plane on what happened afterwards with the dogs and the water. Like, all right, this was the end result. Just for those, because there may be someone that is listening to this and is like, I've never knew this detail of the story, right? Right. right. And 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 seeing the connection between you know, all this intricate detail on how this impact the national law. Mm -hmm. um, so kids all across the city essentially got involved to uh, play their role mm -hmm. in the movement. And it was a, it was a multi-day process. Oh, like yeah. one day, a whole bunch of kids out. Next day is our turn. Mm -hmm. Third, you know, so there, there was this, there was this process to bring light, right? right. Leverage in the media. You're seeing how they're treated. Now folks are seeing in Arkansas, they just put a dog on a child. That's right. not right. You know, now folks in New York, now the president is like, what's going on? Yeah. You know, and, and Kennedy gets involved. He calls King down here in Birmingham uh, at the Drew family house. You know, mm. uh, shout out to Jeff Drew. Um, <laughs> and basically it's like, you know, you all need to stop this madness, you know. Mm. And they're like, you know, King's basically telling him, you have legislation on your desk that you can help with yeah. this situation. Right. Sign the legislation. Right. Help us. If you're not going to do that, then we're going to keep this going. Right. You know, right. and that's and that's exactly what happened. But, you know, with the with the efforts of these young people, you know, and then those images going all over the world, you yep. know, there's uh, archival footage of um, newspapers from Russia with these images on the front. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And so, especially, the, and you got to understand with the Russian relations at this time, you know, it was, mm. it was a, it was a relationship on not only diplomatically, but it was a racial thing. Yeah. You know, Russia is saying to the world, you know, black people get treated well over here. You know, mm. it, was, it was a black, it was a, it was a black Cuban uh, person that was the first Russian person in space. You know, so wow. so so there's these issues going on, and so Kennedy's like, you know, we can't be outdone by these folks. You, you know, y'all making us look bad, basically. Right. And King's like, no, we ain't stopping nothing. You right. know, and they keep that going. Um, they fill the jails, which is a, a serious uh, campaign strategy that I can't think of much any other place where they filled the jails the way they did here in Birmingham. The fact that that was a strategy, the fact that it's just like fill it up. Yeah, we got to fill it. We got to fill, fill those it up. jails. We gotta f now, now you got to listen to what I had to say. There's nowhere <laughs> for you to put me. Right. You got to listen. Let's let's negotiate, you know, and that's is exactly what happened. And it was the business leaders of of Birmingham mm. that were the first ones to sit at the table to negotiate, right? You know, and they right. made concessions, right? You know, right. and then honestly, it took a little while for those concessions to kick in. Yeah, they didn't honor their agreement uh, first, and so Fred had to well, come that's back. That's consistent. Look, Fred had to come <laughs> back and and threaten them again. Like y'all, yeah, y'all saw what happened in May, right? Right. You want that to happen again? We'll make that happen again. So, so you telling me the government can't play spades? They don't. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, well, they tried though, man. They did a lot of they did a lot of shady stuff, man. They they tried to stop giving uh, public assistance out to black black people. They tried to hit them in their pockets, man, hard. They tried to they tried yeah. to limit food supplies in certain areas. Yeah, look at that. You know they did what they could, but the black people were just resilient, and it was led by college students and Miles College and other places. 
you know, rallying the troops, student leaders like uh, uh, Reverend Webb. Yeah. And people like that at their schools yeah. <laughs> yeah. to rally the troops right. to make that happen. Right. But they tried to sh they tried to get them yeah. in, in, in many different ways. Right. So they right. were boycotting. And so the city was like, okay, when you go boycott, we just gonna stop giving you what you deserve. Ooh, that sounds like Kaepernick. That's a whole nother <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that, so it's, it's a lot of little tricky stuff like that. That is, th this is, and as you can see, there is a an alignment to, as we learn about Shuttlesworth, as we learn about Birmingham, as we learn about some of these different pieces of this story, there is a role money plays. Oh, yeah. So just as you just mentioned, they were not um, honoring that particular commitment. And so they said, you know what? <laughs> Since y'all want to act like that, let's hit them where it hurts us the most, the pockets, right? And uh, hurts them the most, which is it's essentially in reciprocity, it would, it would hurt anyone, right? Like if, I, if you hurt my income, you hurt my ability to be able to feed myself, you know, now I'm looking at you sideways or I'm going to do what you need me to do, right? right? And um, so let's talk about Shuttle, Shuttlesworth post-legacy. So what – so – He's the man in Birmingham, mm -hmm. right? Laid a, an amazing foundation, infrastructure, leadership. There's a lot of entities that are still exist because of him. Um, um, but as he as he evolved in life, he didn't stay in Birmingham. No, and you know what? A lot of people don't know that that he it was in the middle of the movement that he actually moved to Cincinnati. Wow, you know, and so he was um, literally traveling traveling back from Cincinnati to Birmingham every Monday night. To be there at one of those meetings for the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights, I believe he left Birmingham in '62. Wow! And so, to, so to come back and forth and then organize the '63 movement mm. in that process, you know, that's dedication, you know, that's and that's an effort. Yeah. Um, matter of fact, you know, Bethel Baptist Church and you know where the parsonage was right next to that when he, when that church when he his house first got bombed, it's right in between the church and the house. Um, the second time the church got bombed was while he was he was there. That third time it got bombed, Fred wasn't even the pastor anymore, <laughs> you know. But because that's the name that these folks knew, right. you know, the church that they knew, right? You know, uh, they say the the past the new pastor had to put a sign up that says Fred is not. Fred, here. Hey man, look man, he's not here man. anymore. <laughs> you know, leave us alone. He's not here anymore. Right. But Fred, you know, with that dedication, he was he was moving back and forth, and so. Once this, you know, campaign started to kind of, you know, finish up and you get the Civil Rights Act of 64, the Voting Rights Act of 65, which Fred was, um, you know, also um, helping to organize and things uh, for the Selma to Montgomery March and things of that nature. You know, Fred's been involved in all of these major campaigns, but he also recognized that there was something going on in Cincinnati while he was there. And um, so he started to organize things in the city of Cincinnati to fight against um, not only uh, disproportionate wages that workers were receiving, um, I'm not exactly sure what the what the industry was, um, but then also there was a housing thing that was going on where blacks weren't we weren't able to get you know redlining and things of that yep. nature where blacks weren't able to get housing, and so he started a foundation to help blacks with uh, low interest loans and things like that wow. to get, get housing. Um, and he also went on the the same Fred, you know, campaign. Yeah. Marching and, and, and being a public figure, um, uh, you know, standing up against these injustices. Um, I have an organization in Cincinnati that I'm pretty uh, close with, and they talk about Fred all the time. Yeah. You know, every time yeah. they come down here, they talk about Fred and the things he did in Cincinnati. And so, wow. And so his, his efforts as an activist— uh, or actionist. Mm. Uh, let me say that. That's that's the that's the term that Fred coined. Um, that he was an actionist for justice, you right. know, not necessarily an activist. To kind of yeah. separate himself from yeah. King and some yeah. others. Yeah. You know, say so that Fred takes this a step further. Uh, but you know, he was very instrumental in, in helping people. You know, um, even when he touched down in a new city. Yeah. With 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 different issues. Right. You know, right. Uh, and so he stayed that kind of person all the way to the day he died. Problem solver, brother. That that living legend, uh, um, his legacy continues and, and expands. I'm super grateful we were able to get Charles on to talk about this. He'll be back, y'all. Uh, um, but also, you were able to hear some of the ways. What's the best way to get in contact with you? Of course, through the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute. Um, but there are other ways in which Charles can really, you know, can can scratch that itch of of yeah, history, yeah, right? Um, if, you can you can you can look at me at uh, on Instagram. It's uh, 
uh, at Marching On Tours, at Marching On Tours, or um, at Charles Woods, I, I, I. Um, that's probably the easiest way to get a yeah. hold of me, you know, yeah. without putting all, all my information out in the street. Um, but you all in the Birmingham area, you know, make sure you come by the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute. Make sure you look out for me. Um, I also have a website, Marching On Tour Company, uh, dot com. If you all want to get a city tour or something like that, you know, look me up. Yeah. Just want to talk, hang out. Do it, do it, do it. Charles, we appreciate your OG. Yeah. Thank you. As y'all know, y'all stay cool, stay on top of it, and of course, stay planted.